Welcome again. Let's look at the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is a major arterial supply to the brain. It arises from the common carotid artery, as we have said before. If you go through our lecture on the external carotid artery, internal carotid artery is the second sub-branch of the common carotid artery. This is the common carotid artery, and this is where they bifurcate into the internal carotid and the external carotid. This bifurcation, of course, occur at the level of the fourth cervical vertebra, and this also corresponds to the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. We've said this in our previous lecture. You can go and check that out to upgrade your knowledge. The part through which the internal carotid artery runs can be divided into four parts from where they emerge from the common carotid artery to the point where they finally terminate. So we have the cervical region. This is the part that it runs along the cervical region. That is the neck region. So from where it originates to the point where it gains its entrance to enter into the cranium. And this is the cervical region from the point where they originate to the point where it is about to enter into the cranial cavity. Then we have the second region, which is the petrous part. The petrous part is the part which runs through the petrous part of the temporal bone. So there's a part that it runs within this space before it finally exits into the cranial fossa. And this is the petrous part from where it is about to enter into the cranium to the point where it exits to enter into the cranial cavity. Then we have the third region, which is the cavernous part. When it enters into the cranial cavity, the first structure that it pierces is the cavernous sinus, and it runs through this structure before it finally terminates. So the region where it runs within the cavernous sinus is termed the cavernous part, and this is the cavernous part. Then the last region is the cerebral region. The cerebral region is after the cavernous sinus region. And this is like the terminal end of the internal carotid artery. So this is like the final part of the internal carotid artery. So we are going to be looking at these regions one after the other, see how they run, also see the possible branches that they give within this space. So let's take a look at the course within the cervical part. Within the cervical region, we said that this is the point where they originate from. We have the common carotid artery dividing into the external carotid that goes to supply structures within the face, head, and neck region on the outside. And we have the internal carotid artery running upward along the cervical region before it finally gets to the region where it can assess the cranial cavity. The event that, of course, occurs around the origination of the internal carotid artery is the carotid sinus. If you look at the point where they originate, the internal carotid presents a form of dilation around this point. And this dilation is termed the carotid sinus or the carotid bulb. It's like a vascular expansion. And this is the carotid sinus. This is the enlargement of the carotid artery. These sites are so created to regulate pressure because the increase that they create in their space tends to increase the quantity of blood that flows through them and thereby modulating the quantity of blood that gets to reach the brain. So this region contains baroreceptors that are able to regulate pressure depending on what the brain requires. So after this point, the internal carotid artery continue in its journey. It proceeds upward along the cervical region before it finally gets to the carotid foramen, which is located on the petrous part of the temporal bone. And it is seen that this region does not give any branch. It just goes along that part solely. The petrous part is the part that is seen within the petrous part of the temporal bone. We said that it gained entrance into the carotid foramen. The carotid foramen is around the petrous part of the temporal bone. It is through this foramen that it's able to enter into the cranial cavity. From the carotid foramen, it now enters through the carotid canal. So it gained its entrance into the carotid canal through the carotid for our men. But one interesting thing about the carotid canal is that, is that it does not run vertically. So there's a kind of bending along the path within this petrous section. So it's able to give three sub regions. We have the ascending region or the vertical region. And this can be well projected here. This is the ascending part where it has sent. Then we have the genome, which is the part that it bends. And this is the second region. 
We have the last sub part of the petrous part of the internal carotid artery. And this is the final part by which is able to terminate into the cranial cavity. And the region of the cranial cavity that it finally enters into is the middle cranial fossa. And so we have another foramen just very close to it, which is the foramen lacerum. The foramen lacerum creates passageway for the petrosal nerve, which is a branch of the facial nerve. This foramen is so located close to the carotid foramen, but the internal carotid artery does not pass through the foramen lacerum, but it crosses over it. If you look at the part by which it runs, from this image, you will see that it runs, and because of its curvature, is able to run over the foramen lacerum, but it does not pass through it. It only runs over it before it finally exits the middle cranial fossa. So within the petrous part of the temporal bone, the internal carotid artery is able to give off two branches. So it gives off the carotid-tympanic artery and also the artery to the pterygoid canal, which may also be referred to as the Vidian artery. The parotico-tympanic artery also further divides. It gives branches to the tympanic cavity. And we also have the Vidian artery, giving branches to supply the upper pharynx and also giving smaller branches to supply the tympanic cavity. So it's able to give just two branches within this pectoral region before it finally enters into the cranial cavity. So let's look at what happens to the internal carotid artery when it finally gains entrance into the cranial cavity. And that takes us to the cavernous part. This is the cavernous sinus region of the internal carotid artery. As soon as it exits the cranial fossa, the first region where it enters into is the middle cranial fossa. We've said this before, but it finds its way into the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus is a dura venous sinus that is located around the lateral body of the sphenoid bone. Within the cavernous sinus, we can see a number of nerves that are embedded within it. And within the cavernous sinus, it also gives off a number of branches. So the first one is the meningoapophyseal artery. The meningoapophyseal artery runs from this part of the internal carotid artery. And this further subdivide into other branches, which include the dosal meningeal artery, the inferior hypophyseal artery, and also tentorial artery. The dosal meningeal artery supplies the meninges, specifically the dura mater around the posterior part, so it goes towards the back region. And the inferior hypophyseal artery supplies the pituitary gland, and we have the tentorial artery also as a branch of the meningeal artery. We have a second branch, that's the capsular branches. These capsular branches, they are also a sub-branch of the internal carotid within the cavernous sinus. What they supply is the wall of the cavernous sinus, so they give arterial supply to the walls of the cavernous sinus. And the last one are branches of the inferior lateral trunk. So they're actually a collection of branches. So, and so they supply adjacent dura matter and also give supply to the cranial nerve that are embedded within the cavernous sinus. Then the cerebral part, the final region of the internal carotid artery, it finally pierces the cavernous sinus. Thereby having its way out within the cerebral region. And this is where it gives off the cerebral branches. As soon as it exits the cavernous sinus, it gives off three branches. And this includes the posterior communicating artery, the anterior choroidal artery, and the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery goes to the anterior region to supply structures that are embedded within the socket. While the anterior choroidal artery supplies a number of subcortical structures, which include the optic tract, the median globus pallidus, the median geliculate body in the thalamus, and other structures that are located in the subcortical region of the brain. Then we have the posterior communicating artery, which tends to connect the middle cerebral artery with the posterior cerebral artery. The posterior cerebral artery is a branch of the vertebral artery. After giving off these three branches, they now finally terminate into two. And the two arteries they terminate into are the middle cerebral artery, this is the middle cerebral artery, and the anterior cerebral artery.
From the point where they originate, which is the common carotid artery, they run upward to enter into the carotid canal. Along this part, they do not give off any branch. They enter into the petrous part of the temporal bone along the carotid canal. And within this space, they give off two branches, the carotid panic branch, and also the artery to the pterygoid canal. That is what it gives off within its petrous part, after which they exist. And the region where it finds itself is in the middle cranial fossa specifically. As soon as it exits, it finds its way into the cavernous sinus where it gives off also a number of branches before it finally exits the cavernous sinus to give off the ophthalmic branch, the posterior communicating artery, and also the anterior choroidal artery. Then finally, they terminate into the middle cerebral artery and also the anterior cerebral artery. So this is like a summary of all the events that the internal carotid artery presents from the region where they originate to finally where they terminate. So this is question time. And the first one states that we should highlight the different regions of the internal carotid artery. This has been well explained during the course of the lecture, and I hope it will come easy for us. The second question is to describe the terminal branches of the internal carotid artery. We also already discussed this. Then the last question is list the branches of the internal carotid artery during its course in the cavernous sinus. We say that within the cavernous sinus, it does gives off a number of branches. So thank you for watching. Let's continue to stay tuned.